Zig 0.15.1 introduces two new interfaces, STDIO Reader and STDIO Writer. And as you can see, a small but important change occurred. STDIO became STDIO with a capital I, because the goal is to create a new interface called STDIO that will be responsible to handle any IO operation like interacting with the file system, networking, timers, or really anything that can block the current thread of execution. What is remarkable about this is that it will allow us to write code such that the logic will be decoupled from the concurrency model. I mean, think about it. You will write a function once and it will work with single-threaded blocking I.O., single-threaded non-blocking I.O., multi-threading, green threads, thread pool, or any concurrency model you can come up with. This is relevant because the way most programming languages provide I.O. is through a sort of streaming interface. It seems like Andrew spent a lot of time and thoughts into it and decided that Zig needed a better, more robust and more efficient streaming interface. STDIO Reader and Writer are interfaces because they both have a vtable, which is a struct containing multiple function pointers that implementations need to, well, implement. Something important to notice is that these functions take a pointer to the interface, and that's a sign that reader and writer are intrusive interfaces. Intrusive interface can be a bit tricky to wrap your head around, so if you need help to understand them, you can watch one of my previous video. But to quickly summarize, you implement an intrusive interface by creating a struct with a field of the type of the interface, and then you implement the functions in the vtable by creating functions matching the function pointers type signature. Inside these functions, if you need to access functions or fields of your concrete type, you can use add field parent pointer to get a pointer to the concrete type. The trick is that the first argument that these functions are going to receive will be a pointer to the interface field of your concrete type. For example, if we take a look at stdfs file writer, which is an implementation of the stdio writer, we can see the field interface of type stdio writer and the drain function that takes an io writer as a parameter and gets a pointer to a file writer using add field parent pointer. Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, just watch my video on intrusive interfaces. All right, if we go back to the STDIO reader and writer, what's interesting is that they both store a buffer and this comes with some big benefits. To illustrate them, let's look at a short example that prints hello a thousand times. What's important here is that I create a buffer that will hold the data I want to print on the screen. Then I get a file representing STD out and create a writer to the standard output with the buffer I just created. This function returns an stdfs file writer, which is, like we saw previously, an implementation of the stdio writer. So I can create a pointer to the actual stdio writer by getting the address of the interface field. Creating a pointer to the interface like this is unnecessary and I don't really recommend doing it, but here I just want to highlight the different types we are dealing with. All right. One cool thing about having a buffer in the interface is that we get a lot of functions for free that we don't need to write ourselves and that operates on the buffer. One such function is the print method. If I put it in a for loop to print hello a thousand times and run it, I get 954 hello, not 1000. Well, that's because I forgot to flush. You see, when you use a buffer, functions like print will write to the buffer. Once the buffer is full, or more precisely, when the new data doesn't fit in the remaining space, it will be flushed automatically and the following call to print will write the data back to the beginning of the buffer. This is why this buffer is referred to as a ring buffer. So once you're done writing to your buffer, it is very likely that there will be some remaining bytes in it that haven't been flushed. So you need to call flush yourself. And you need to do it at the end because even if you can do something like this, I wouldn't recommend using defer to flush. Okay, if we run this program now, it works as expected. Now, you might be asking yourself, why bother with the buffer at all? 
can't we just write to the standard output directly? Well, yes, we can. If we don't want the IO writer to use a buffer, we can pass an empty slice to the writer method and remove the call to flush. And this works fine. But the reason why you should use a buffer is to minimize the number of syscalls, which are much slower than writing to a buffer. We can verify this by using the common strace on Linux. If we call strace with the unbuffered version of this program, we can see that a write v syscall is made for every hello we print on the screen. While if we use a buffer, we see way less syscalls. I modified the previous programs to print a million times and compiled them with release fast and on my machine, the buffered version was about 40 times faster than the unbuffered one. So as written in the release note, please use buffering and don't forget to flush. Hopefully I convince you that buffering is important, but this doesn't explain why putting the buffer inside the interface is interesting. This choice is not arbitrary or made merely for convenience. It's a deliberate one. Because the interface has access to the buffer, the number of indirect calls, the number of times we call the function store in the vtable is limited. If the buffer was in the implementation, then all the buffer logic would be inside the concrete functions, which means that every time you would use the interface, it would need to make an indirect call to the concrete function. And indirect calls are not only slower to execute, but they are also opaque to compiler optimizations. Vtable function pointers hold runtime known values, so the compiler treats them like black boxes. You will probably hear people talk about doing the work above or below the Vtable. That's what they are talking about. The work you do before calling the virtual function is work done above the Vtable. And this is preferable. Okay, let's take a break from the writer interface to look at the reader interface and see how we can use it to read the standard input. First, let's define a buffer to receive the user input. Then we need to get std in using stdfsfile.std in. Now that we have a file, we can get an stdfs file reader by passing a buffer to the reader function. And then we can get an IO reader by taking a pointer to the interface field of the file reader. Now we can start reading using one of the many functions of the IO reader. For example, we can read one character at a time with take byte. This function returns an error union, so we can use the while else construct like this. Here, I'm going to skip new lines, print all other characters, and break on the letter Q. Let's try it. Sometimes giving up is a good idea. Okay, works fine. Before looking at how this actually works, I just want to point out common mistakes to avoid. Here, I'm creating some intermediate variables to show you the different types involved. But there's a chance that you will be tempted to write something like this. But this will not compile, because if you take a pointer to a temporary value, you end up with a constant pointer. An even worse mistake would be to make a copy of the interface like this. This is worse because it can compile and it can actually work, but this will lead to undefined behaviors. You see, when we call the reader function, we get a temporary file reader and then copy its field interface. Once this is done, the file reader should be considered destroyed, even if it may still exist somewhere in memory. This is a problem because the interface field is used with add field parent pointer to get a pointer to the file reader. But if the file reader is destroyed, we can't really get a pointer to it. We'll get a pointer to some random data in memory. So the file reader needs to have the same or a longer lifetime than the stdio reader stored in the interface field. Knowing this, you may be tempted to keep the reader alive and still make a copy of the interface field. Once again, this is undefined behavior because now when add field parent pointer is used, it will be used on the variable thinking that this variable is part of a file reader struct and will return some random memory address. So the simple rule is to never copy the interface field unless you really know what you're doing. So we can fix this mistake by taking a reference to the IO reader. This is fine, but what I would recommend you to do instead is to keep the interface attached to the concrete object. Like, instead of creating a new variable, just use it with the concrete object. 
that will prevent you from making mistakes and will make your code more explicit. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about how all of this actually works. So the IO reader has a vtable, an internal buffer, and two other fields. Seek indicates the number of bytes that have already been consumed from the buffer, or in other words, it points to the next byte that is ready to be consumed, and indicates the total number of buffered bytes or the position of the first empty byte in the buffer. In our example, when we start, the buffer is empty, so seek and end have the value zero. When we call take byte, it will see that the buffer is empty, so it will call read back from the vtable, which will make a syscall and wait for the user to type something. When the user press enter, the data is saved in the reader's buffer and the value of end is modified. Then the first byte in the buffer is returned and the seek position is increased by one. With this while loop, we will read all the buffered bytes and we'll make another syscall to get some new data. If there's enough space in the buffer, the new data will be added to the end and the end position will be updated. Otherwise, if there's not enough space, the data will be copied at the beginning of the buffer and both the seek and end position will be updated. But reading one byte at a time isn't fun. Let's read five bytes at a time with take array. It's the same ID, but this time, instead of getting a byte, you get a slice of bytes. The slice points to somewhere in the buffer, so if the content of the buffer changes, the slice's content will change too. All right, if we try to read more bytes than the buffer can contain, for example, if we try to take 20 bytes when the buffer can only hold 10, it crashes. But you're probably asking yourself, why would anyone do this? Are you stupid? Yes, but now let's look at the function take delimiter exclusive to read line by line. And let's use a small buffer. If you enter a small line, it works fine. But if you enter something longer, then you get a stream to long error. That's not very nice. So if you're trying to do something like this, when it's difficult to predict the size of the buffer or if you need to read a lot of data, then one solution is to dynamically allocate data on the heap. So let me introduce to you the stream functions and the allocating writer. As you can see, the stdio reader interface comes with functions similar to the take once, but instead of returning a value, it will write the value into an stdio writer. The standard library comes with a few writer implementations. A useful one is called allocating. Instead of giving it a buffer, we give it an allocator and it will use an array list to construct a buffer with the necessary capacity to hold the data. So let's modify our code to make it work with the streaming functions and the allocating writer. Let's start by creating an allocator, then an allocating writer. Now let's replace take delimiter exclusive with stream delimiter. We give it a pointer to the IO writer of the allocating writer and a delimiter. Now we can get the line entered by the user with the written method and we can print it. Then we need to clear the buffer data we just read using clear retaining capacity. Otherwise, in the next iteration, we will print all the data accumulated since the beginning. And finally, we need to toss the new line character from the reader. Otherwise, you will only be able to read the user input once and you will be stuck in a loop. Now, even with a small input buffer, you can read arbitrary long lines. Let's keep going with another example and another writer. Let's say I have this file with corrupted data represented by question marks and I want to display the valid data and count the number of corrupted bytes. But before you get mad, I know this isn't the greatest example and you would never actually do this, but it's just an easy way to demonstrate a few things. So first, let's open the file and create a file reader. Now I want to create two writers, one to print the valid data to the standard output and another one to discard the question marks. So we already saw how to make a writer to std out, but to discard bytes, stdio writer provides an implementation called discarding that we can initialize with a buffer. Here I'm giving it an empty slice because I'm too lazy to create a real buffer. Now using the file readers interface field, I can use the pick byte method to look at the next bytes in the buffer. 
This returns an error union, so I can use a while else to extract the value. Then I can use a switch if it's a question mark, then I stream the byte from the file reader to the discard writer, otherwise I stream the value to std out. Once the reader is done reading everything in the file, pick byte will return the error end of stream. So I'm also going to switch on the error. If the error is end of stream, then I need to make sure I don't forget to flush the standard outputs writer and I'll also print the number of bytes that were discarded. Otherwise, for any other error, I just display it. All right, let's run it. And that's very nice. This was overkill, but I wanted to show you how you can easily use multiple writers or readers. I could keep going and show you more examples, but this would take forever, so instead let me show you what's available in the standard library right now. Inside stdio writer, you will find failing that just returns errors, hash then hashing for hashing shenanigans, and fixed that provide a writer that writes to a fixed buffer and returns an error when it's full. In stdio reader, you have failing, hashed, fixed, ending, limited, and a lot of errors. You will also find some implementations in std.json, std.http, std.net.stream, and probably in other places. They're just a lot, and I will let you find out by yourself by reading the documentation. All right, I'm going to be honest, I wanted to talk about more things, but this video already took me way too much time, and I don't know enough to talk about some of these concepts. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and really, you're just going to leave like this without subscribing? Oh, without without tipping, really? <laughs> okay, bye. Whatever. I'm tired. I'm so tired.